Hi, <clears throat> today we're going to talk about propaganda and logical fallacies. So I'm on the content page in our course under the module Rhetoric and Claims. I'm going to scroll down and we're going to be looking at this article by Donna Wolfett Cross. I've already clicked it and opened it up. So the title, Propaganda, How Not to Be Bamboozled. <clears throat> this is a great article because it actually forms a perfect academic essay. Um, and so we're going to be looking at it not only for what she's talking about when it comes to propaganda, but how does she present that information in a way that develops the idea and really sets up the, the topic for us. So here in this first section, this is our introduction. And so easily we could have just made this one large paragraph instead of breaking it down into small paragraphs, but that's what she did. So one of the first things she did was she discussed what propaganda is. And so defining is a really important part of uh, an essay if you're really focused on a term and how people either don't understand it or don't recognize it. And so one of the things that she tells us about propaganda that might be surprising to a lot of people is that it isn't um, bad. It's neutral. It's what people do with propaganda that makes it good or evil, right? And so she says right up here, she defines it, propaganda is simply a, matter, uh, a means of persuasion, and so it can be used uh, for good causes as well as bad, right? And so in the next section here of her introduction, she's now going to make that connection to the reader's lives because that's part of what you do in the introduction. You identify your audience in a subtle fashion, and then you show them why this topic is relevant to them, what's been happening that makes it something that they should pay attention to. And so she does that by saying that, you know, we are all affected by propaganda. She says, for good or evil, it shapes our lives on a thousand subjects. And then she kind of gives us this nice range of things from toothpaste to who you uh, elect when you go to the polls. So she shows us that it's the mundane, everyday stuff, but it's also the really important things like voting for a president or something. Then she tells us how does it work, All right? So she says it's like magic. It tricks us. Uh, you know, it, we're looking over here to the right when to the left the magician is, you know, doing something that deceives us. Uh, and she says <clears throat> that propaganda works best with an uncritical audience, right? So here she is laying the foundation for the argument that she's making. Uh, and then she throws us a big one. She says, Joseph Goebbels, propaganda minister of, in Nazi Germany, wants to find his work as conquest of the masses. And so, you know, she is telling us what's at stake here, that it's not just about toothpaste, that propaganda can manipulate people in such ways that they would co commit the atrocities that happened in Nazi Germany, right? And this, again, is how she is trying to show us why it's so important that we aren't bamboozled, as she says in the topic, right? She says, the masses would not have been conquered, however, if they had known how to challenge into question, how to make distinctions between propaganda and reasonable arguments. So this is what people need to be able to do to protect themselves from being conquested or conquered or, or fooled, right? So in this last paragraph, we kind of have her thesis, right? And this is a professional essay. So professional essays, they get to do things a little bit differently than we do in academia. They have a little bit more room to play. So she doesn't have just one sentence. So it says, people are bamboozled mainly because they don't recognize propaganda when they see it. They need to be informed about the various devices that can be used to mislead and deceive. The following then are some common pitfalls for the unwary, right? So technically, really, it's those last two sentences or maybe even that middle sentence that is her real thesis. People need to be informed about the various devices. And here are some, right? So she's kind of spread it out over a couple of sentences, but that's what her, her thesis is, right? That here are some devices and if you can pick these out, you'll be less likely to be bamboozled, right? And so each one of these sections that's numbered one, two, three, whatever, is like a body paragraph, but it's a body paragraph section, if you will. She has split this into smaller paragraphs, but really it functions exactly like the meat method that I use in this class that's in your academic essay master guide, right? So she gives us a heading. Now, we don't do this 
in academic essays for MLA style. So please don't follow this in terms of how you're supposed to do your essays. But she goes, gives us this, right? And so our first sentence with that label right here, right? Because she refers to it as its title suggests. This is her topic sentence. So as this title suggests, this device consists of labeling people or ideas with words of bad connotation. So she's defining the term name calling in the, in the first part, right? And then she tells us, she explains, well, what does that mean? What is the propagandist doing when, uh, when they're using name calling, right? She then moves into this next section where she's now explaining about how it works, right? She says, bad names have played a tremendously important role in the history of the world. They've ruined reputations and ended lives. So she's kind of explaining how, you know, the function of name calling and that it's, it's, it's an old technique, right? Then she gives us more explanation that involves some evidence, some examples, right? Now, Cross is an expert in this field. So she does not use research. She uses common knowledge uh, of these. You know, her definition of name callings is just a generic definition that she uses her own words, but nobody owns the definition. So because she's an expert, she doesn't have to use credible sources. She's really relying on ethos here. Um, but, you know, she could have easily given us real examples from, um, you know, sources that she could document. She could have given us some, uh, you know, expert uh, information, you know, that she could have cited. But because she is an expert, she just relies on common knowledge. So if we see here, she says, name calling can be used against policies, practices, beliefs, and ideals, as well as against individuals, groups, races, and nations. It is at work when we hear a candidate for office described as a foolish idealist or a two-faced liar, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then she actually gives us some more specific kinds of examples right? Congressman Jane Doe is, Congresswoman Jane Doe is a, a bleeding heart, uh, or Senator is a tool of Washington. So again, she doesn't give us real examples. She gives us uh, <clears throat> typical examples, right? So then her last paragraph then is kind of her analysis. The point here is that when the propagandist uses name calling, he doesn't want us to think, merely to act, react blindly, unquestioningly. So the best defense against being taken in by name calling is to stop and ask, forgetting the bad name attached to it, what are the merits of the idea itself? What does this really mean anyway? So when you see the way this paragraph works, we have our topic sentence up here. We have explanation, right? Then we have examples. And then our analysis here is, okay, so what are we supposed to do with this information? And in every paragraph that she, or every body section that she has, she always ends up by telling us, um, you know, why does it work and how can we defend against it, right? So it's going to follow that same uh, format through every one. So when you're wondering about how do you put together an essay, this is a great example of how you use that meat method uh, to develop an idea.